Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. Seattle is obviously the biggest city in the state of Washington. But what's the second biggest? Well, it's this city right here. The city of Spokane. Over 200,000 people live there in the city on the eastern part of Washington. And while Spokane does not have any teams in any of the major professional sports leagues, including the National Football League, they do love their Seattle Seahawks. For all intents and purposes, the Seahawks are the hometown team. And it makes complete sense as to why. By no means is it an easy drive from Seattle to Spokane, as it's four hours away. But it's in the same state, and it's by far the closest team that they've got. In fact, back in the day, being a Seahawk fan in Spokane might have been the best case scenario. Not only were you in a place where the Seahawks were the de facto hometown team, and not only did you get to watch all the games on television, since there was no way that the CBS, NBC, or Fox affiliate, depending on who had the game, was not going to show the Seahawks play, but you weren't subject to any of the local blackout laws if they did apply. Because blackout laws only apply within a 75 mile radius, and Spokane is 279 miles away. So you were in the clear. Being a Seahawks fan in Spokane seemed like it had its major benefits. That is, except when it came to this game right here. Because to open up the 1984 NFL season, the Seattle Seahawks took on the Cleveland Browns. And if you were in Spokane, amazingly enough, you were not able to watch this game. In fact, you were unable to watch any football game, period. It's a bizarre broadcasting controversy that deserves a deep dive today, especially with the Seahawks and Browns facing off against each other this weekend. Because this definitely seems like a case of the NFL overstepping its boundaries for no real reason whatsoever. Because this is the story behind the bizarre broadcasting drama between NBC, the NFL, the Seattle Seahawks, and the opening games of the 1984 season. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, we need some context to understand the importance of this scheme as well as what the original plan was for the NBC affiliate in Spokane, KHQ. In September 3rd, 1984, it's the opening week of the NFL season, and we've got an AFC matchup on our hands over at the Kingdom up in Seattle, between the Cleveland Browns and the Seattle Seahawks. Obviously, this is a big game, in the sense that you want to start the season off on the right foot, as you would much rather be 1-0 and feeling good to kick the new year off, than be 0-1. However, this game was big for a few other reasons as well. Number one, this was a battle between two teams that were very good last season and finished with identical 9-7 records, with Seattle's win over New England on the final week of the season actually helping knock Cleveland out of the playoffs, in a controversy that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. And number two, just looking at how last year started off, excluding the AFC Central, because every team in that division started 0-1, and someone had to make the playoffs there by default, of the four other teams to make it from the AFC, three of them had a win under their belt after the first week. So this game was a pretty interesting one to start the new year off, to say the least. However, you might have noticed something bizarre about the date of this game. The first Sunday of the NFL season was September 2nd. This game on September 3rd, was not a Monday Night Football game, as the Monday Night Battle that night on Labor Day was the battle between the Dallas Cowboys and the Los Angeles Rams, in a rematch of the Wild Card round from last year, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. So why the heck was this game played on Labor Day on a Monday afternoon? The game started at 4 o'clock Eastern and 1 o'clock in Seattle. So what gives? Well, the controversy behind that is absolutely insane, and it's not the focus of the video, but it is important to talk about at least somewhat 
to understand why the game was being held on Labor Day. Because without this date change, this broadcasting controversy does not happen in the first place. At some point, I am going to do a video on the conflict that caused this game to shift from its original Sunday time to a Labor Day afternoon kickoff. Because there are so many moving parts in that one, that it would take another 20 minutes just to talk about that situation in depth. However, to make a long story short, and to give you the Spark Notes version, this game was originally scheduled for Sunday, September 2nd. Just like every other game that week, that was not the Monday night game. However, the Seattle Mariners had a home game on September 2nd as well, as they had a date against the Baltimore Orioles. The Kingdom lease gave the Seahawks the ability to play at the Kingdom for three Sundays in September, while also saying that the Mariners had first priority, with the Mariners joining Major League Baseball later than the Seahawks joining the National Football League. That was the only way it was going to happen. And for years, this wasn't an issue, until Kane County officials totally forgot about the scheduling conflict, forgot to tell the NFL not to schedule a game on that Sunday, and the NFL did it. Neither side was budging, which led to the Mariners threatening to relocate and break their lease, since they now had cause to do so, as this was a material breach of their contract. However, six weeks before the game, right as the Mariners were about to take the city to court, the Seahawks decided to be good neighbors and move their game from Sunday to Monday, so that the Mariners wouldn't break out of the lease. And that's how you got a random regular season game taking place on a Monday afternoon even if it was during a holiday. So you would think that this would be business as usual from a broadcasting standpoint, right? For this game that you've been watching right here, you would think that this would be like all the other games that had to get moved due to bizarre circumstances that were unforeseen and were out of the league's control. The game would be locally televised in the markets originally scheduled to get the game and wouldn't be televised anywhere else. It wouldn't be a national game, but it would be locally televised. So if you were in that city, you would get an extra game over the air for that weekend. NBC tried to get this game to be nationally televised, but the NFL stepped in and said that wouldn't be fair to anyone involved, as it would not be fair to ABC, who actually paid for the rights to have a Monday night game, and this could cut into the ratings due to oversaturation, and would not be fair to CBS, who would have one less nationally televised game than NBC, due to circumstances completely out of their control. But in the Cleveland area, and in the Seattle area, you would be able to turn on your television and watch the Browns play the Seahawks. Not a bad way to spend your Labor Day if I do say so myself. And you would think that this would be the same thing in Spokane, right? I mean, Spokane got every Seahawks game. They were practically Seahawks territory. Even though, by the NFL definition, they were not a secondary market of Seattle, they basically acted like one. It's almost like El Paso. Sure, El Paso is nine hours away from Dallas, and sure, they're not a secondary market being over 630 miles away. But it's Cowboys country, and they're getting every Cowboys game. Spokane would have gotten the game had been played on Sunday. That wouldn't have been an issue. The NBC affiliate for Spokane, KHQ, would have televised the game in that late window at 1 o'clock pacific time, and this would be a complete non-story. Almost in the same vein as a city in Virginia showing a Commander's game is a non-story. However, this is where the NFL decided to do something rather bizarre, and quite frankly, rather stupid. Because the NFL decided to be super strict about the markets that would get the Seahawks-Browns game. It was not going to be any place that would have gotten the game had it been played on its regular Sunday D. But rather, it was going to be just Cleveland and just Seattle. If you were not in Seattle or Cleveland, tough luck. But you were not going to get the game. This meant that Spokane, which was Seahawks country, and which televised every single Seahawks game, and would have televised the game no problem if it was on Sunday, like it was originally scheduled to be, was straight out of luck. What's crazy is that the news broke out less than a week before the game, even though they had ample time to prepare. KHQ, the Spokane NBC affiliate, just assumed that they would be showing the game, 
and understandably so. However, not even one week before the opener, the NFL called up and said, yeah, you're probably not going to be allowed to do that. Sorry about that. Larry Gans, the program director for the affiliate, called up NBC for a clarification, and they informed him of the bad news. There was nothing you can do. You're not going to be able to get this game. Even though KHQ was going to show every other Seahawks game that was played on NBC, they would be unable to show this one, simply because it was on a different date. Said Gans, Contractual agreements between NBC and the NFL preclude the game from being seen in any other place other than Seattle and Cleveland stations. But making this even more insane was the fact that this wasn't even entirely true. The NBC affiliate in Seattle, KING, or King, was carrying the game. So anywhere that got King, got the game. And as Jan Gray, who worked for King, said about how King worked when it came to cable, we have some penetration all the way into Idaho on some cable systems. So even though parts of Idaho were going to get this game, despite being further away from Spokane, despite being an entirely different state, and despite not being as Seahawks heavy as Spokane, the actual city of Spokane, as in the second largest city in Washington, was not going to be able to get this game. And to say that Gans was livid about this would be an understatement. Oh man, he was furious. The people of Spokane who were Seahawk fans and expected to see their team play, just like any other week, were livid. And Gans was one of them, especially because this was entirely out of his control and people were blaming his affiliate for this. He tried everything in his power to get KHQ to show the Seahawks game, but every attempt came up short despite the fact that this really didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense when you think about it for a few seconds. It's like if you're a fan of a baseball team, and you see that team anytime they come into town. You ask your parents if you can go to the game, and they say sure. But then, the game gets rained out, so you ask if you can go to the makeup game tomorrow, and they say no. Even though you've got nothing going on that day, you're off from school because it's summertime, your parents are off from work and have nothing planned, and they promised that you could see the game, and you don't have to pay anything extra. Said Gans on this, incredibly bluntly, Val Pinchback, the director of broadcast operations at the NFL office, has said no. So you can lay the blame directly on the NFL office. Well, that's pretty self-explanatory. That drives the point across, doesn't it? Gans continued, saying, We've had a number of viewers call us very irate, and some have taken the initiative to call NBC Sports, and they're saying it's up to KHQ. But it's not. We've done everything in our power to get the game on TV in Spokane. It's the NFL that won't let us. And he wasn't buying the explanation about only being shown in Seattle as the reason why. Because as he said, the broadcast is getting into Moses Lake and the Tri-Cities through cable. From their reaction, we would interpret that they haven't even given cable consideration in determining point-to-point -point broadcasts. To summarize this complaint, the NFL is screwing us over. It's not fair. We'd be able to get this scheme if it was on a Sunday, and the reasoning doesn't even add up, because cities outside of Seattle and cities further away from Spokane are getting this scheme. And yeah, he's absolutely got a valid point there. I can't blame Gans one bit for thinking this way, and for publicly calling out the NFL for this. The logic here seems kind of backwards, and is punishing Spokane for no reason, and for something completely out of their control. Just a bizarre situation all the way around. And it was a real shame that Seahawks fans in the area couldn't watch the game, unless they made a substantial drive to a city that had a signal, and couldn't watch it from the comfort of their own home. Because this was one of the best games in the near decade-long history of the Seahawks franchise, in terms of how well they played. They were just about flawless, as even though they suffered a big loss with a season-ending injury to running back Kurt Warner, at least on this day, they were able to overcome that and win convincingly, taking it by a final score of 33 to nothing. The Seahawks doubled the Browns' first down total, winning that battle 20 to 10. 
the Seahawks nearly tripled the Browns' rushing total, winning that battle 145-52. The Seahawks had about two and a half times more yards than the Browns did, winning that battle 307-102. The Seahawks forced five turnovers and held onto the ball for 36 minutes, just dominating the time of possession. Defensively, the Seahawks absolutely feasted, with the team recording seven sacks, allowing just one play longer than 15 yards, and making quarterback Paul McDonald's day a living nightmare, as McDonald finished the game going 8-for-27, completing just 29% of his passes with no touchdowns, two interceptions, and a passer rating of 13.8, which is worse if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Seahawk fans who were able to watch this game were thrilled. Seahawk fans in Spokane, however, who had to find out via the newspaper the next day, not so much. And again, I cannot stress this enough. Spokane is Seahawks country. I dug through all the newspaper archives and dug through every single game that Spokane had involving the NFL. And not once did they not televise a Seahawks game, predominantly KHQ, the NBC affiliate, or whatever station happened to have the rights to that game. So for them to not get the game between these two teams behind me right here, on a technicality where they would have gotten the game otherwise is just asinine and a terrible decision on the NFL's part, and shows just how complicated and terrible some of the broadcasting rules were back then. As a side note, during the game, you may have noticed some of the phone numbers on the top left corner of the screen. If you have any idea what those phone numbers are, let me know in the comments down below. If you want a hint of what they are, I'll give you one. This game took place on Labor Day. When the Seahawks play the Browns this weekend, Spokane, along with the entire state of Washington, is scheduled to get the game, as they have for every single Seahawks game this year thus far. But when the teams met 40 years ago, that was not the case. Far from it, in fact. Because on Labor Day in 1984, Spokane was left out in the cold. Spokane was left walking alone. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.